This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I am your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, Chinese blogger, and once ate a whole jar of Miracle Whip. True story. My co-host is John Pasden, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinosplice.com, and can use a sundial to tell the time. In this episode, John and I discuss knowledge of Chinese versus proficiency in Chinese. Two things that are all too commonly out of sync with each other, and of course, you'll get a rant and a rave. Guest interview is with Elise Ribbons, playwright, webmistress, radio host, Peking opera performer, social entrepreneur, foodie, yoga teacher, and runner-up for China's Top Chef. She shares her insights into learning Chinese and her path to starring roles in Chinese TV and movies. All this and more. Let's get to it. Hey, coming to you from Shanghai, China. I'm John. This is Jared, and you can learn Chinese. This is the podcast about learning Chinese. But John, you did learn Chinese. You're never done, Jared. There's lots of Chinese,、uh, even if you've come pretty far. That's true. In fact, our interview today, she definitely addresses that issue. It's an issue. Well, today、uh, there's something I wanted to talk about. Well, good because we got to record something. <laughs> well, good thing we have something to talk about. This one specifically came from a discussion that I saw on a forum. And this person was talking about they've been studying Chinese for a long time, and they just felt like they having trouble speaking, still listening. In fact, overall, they said that their speaking or listening skill is still relatively low.、Um, they can know a lot of characters, and they're just having trouble actually speaking the language. And I think this is a challenge that a lot of people deal with. Yeah, it's an issue of、uh, proficiency and fluency, right? And it's it's especially hard when you're not. Living in China, and there just aren't a lot of opportunities to practice Chinese, or it just takes so much effort to find someone to talk to. Yeah, I liken this. It's the difference between having a knowledge of Chinese versus having proficiency in the language and、the、skill. Yeah, and there's two different things. It's like you can know all about、uh, you know some area like about masonry, but maybe you don't know how to lay a brick. You know, it's it's very different. It's it's two different skills. So I think for this person, one good thing is that they have identified the problem. Like they they know that they have the knowledge, but they also know that they haven't got the fluency with the speaking and the listening. And、uh, unfortunately, the answer is quite simple. If you are not good at speaking and listening, you need more of it. If you do have the vocabulary, you have the grammar patterns, you know, you have that knowledge built up, then that means it will be a little easier. But that doesn't make it easy, right? You still have to do the work. The blood and sweat and tears of trying to understand and failing, trying to say something and failing, and then just slowly making progress, right? So I guess the question is, what do you do if you're in this situation? How? What kind of advice can we give to a, someone who's struggling with this, where they've, hey, I've been studying Chinese for a long time, but I just I can't do anything with the language. I, I can't speak. I can't write. I can read some stuff. I if I can understand things in Chinese, but I'm just. I lack that proficiency in Chinese. Well, I think this ties back to the thing we talked about before about like how do you create an immersion environment, right?、Um, but the other thing is it's tied to your goals. So, do you really want to be able to have you know fluent Chinese conversations? And if so, what are you going to talk about?、Um, and that kind of ties into how you should be practicing or what you should be trying to talk about.、Um, but some people, I don't know. I think they want to be able to speak Chinese, but they. They don't have any clear idea why, and so to become clearer on that will also kind of point the way into how maybe you should start practicing. Yeah, it's like what is what is the whole purpose behind this? And I've related some stories in the past. I remember the one story I related. I had learned some words that related to repairing my bike when I got a flat tire in Shanghai one time, and you know, and I remember those because that's something I'm actively using. Or I went to the market to buy things. So this is, I think, this is really point, really important because I even had recently had a friend that was showing me、uh, how he was doing some studying. He was asking me, he's like, Jared, hey, I I just need to really. I, my Chinese, I feel, is like a plateau. I'm kind of stuck at this level, and I really need to get it to kind of the next level. And I said, "Well, what are you doing right now?" And he he's, opens up you know, an app he has on his phone, and he's like, "I'm going through these word lists right now." And I mean, one of the words was like、uh, it was like for an amphibious assault vehicle. Another one was for like a lily pad. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, this is better than not doing anything, right? 
But this is not going to help you reach your goal of becoming more proficient. And we had this discussion. I said, well, what are you using your language for? And he's giving a lot of presentations in front of groups uh, for his for his job. And he's doing a lot of it in Chinese. But he says, like, I know my Chinese has all sorts of little problems in it. I, I have little grammar things. Or I'm not saying things the best way. He's like, but people understand and they get me. And I said, yeah, that's that's true. I said, probably if I were you, one of the best things to do was say, hey, let's get your presentation. Maybe get a tutor. You start going and working through that. You're working through these little problem areas because this is a problem. And I honestly, John, this is a problem I have. Is like I, I easily I start falling back on old patterns of language that I'm comfortable using and that I'm used to doing. And so and it takes some explicit instruction or explicit effort to kind of break out of that. Yeah, another good trick for that is if you're already doing these presentations in Chinese and you need help on it, well, record yourself doing the presentation. That way you can find someone, you know, a tutor, whoever, maybe someone online, and then you can send them the audio, and then they can give you a detailed breakdown of all the issues. Um, hopefully your ego can take it because there are probably going to be more than one or two. And, uh, you know, taking that and then building on that, and in the future you're going to record again and you're going to see improvement. Uh, it's great. Another similar example is um, I know people that are studying Chinese in Shanghai and they have opportunities to, uh, to practice, but then the material that they're officially studying is from a textbook. And you look at the textbook and it's like, oh, chapter on tea ceremony and then you know, chapter on calligraphy and then ancient poetry. And it's like, okay, so you really like tea and, and calligraphy and poetry? No, actually I don't, but that's just what's in the textbook. Well, maybe you should study something that actually relates to the conversations that you're having. Now, obviously, that's kind of a good problem to have because you have an easy way to have those conversations. So let's take it back to um, the example that you gave in the beginning. So this guy, I think he's not in a Chinese environment. Um, he's reading pretty well. He has a decent vocabulary, but he knows that his listening and speaking are not very good, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So one thing that you can do fairly easily would be just to listen to a lot more. Mm -hmm. So he has to find some source of material that is... Um, somewhat spoken, you know, not like reading the news, but real conversations in Chinese. Listen to that. Um, preferably it's content that has, you know, authentic spoken Chinese, but then also has a transcript. Um, so that will improve your, your listening. And, you know, you can go through the transcript if you have a lot of trouble following it. Um, but it's better to listen first. And then, of course, the really big thing is you have to find opportunities to speak. And it needs to be something that overlaps with the type of material that's going to improve your overall speaking ability. So if you're listening to stuff that is the type of thing people talk about, and then you're talking to someone about what you listen to, then it all kind of dovetails nicely and uh, will upgrade your fluency. My thoughts on this is having a fundamental shift in how you are approaching your language learning. Because sometimes people will have that perception that if I'm not studying, I'm not learning, I'm not getting better. And so it's that constant pursuit of building your knowledge of the language. But once again, I think for someone in this instance, the problem is not necessarily the knowledge. It's the proficiency in what it is you know. So you need to look at involving yourself in these activities that allows you to use what it is that you know. And so like you said, you, you know, listening, you know, if you have something in a video or something that has a transcript, okay, great. That's a great opportunity to start practicing what it is that you know. This is another big reason why we always harp on extensive reading, you know, reading at your level that allows you to become proficient in what it is you know. And this is something I've talked about to teachers and with students before is that, you know, if you only know 300 characters, will be fluent in those 300 characters. If you know 500 characters, get fluent in those 500 characters. And it's not just characters, obviously, it's words too. But, and that's you know, one of the designs of graded readers is that it helps you build that solid proficiency in the language that you know. So the concept is like fluency now as opposed to fluency like five years or ten years down the road. That seems to be this far off you know, task. But sometimes when we're studying, that's what a lot of people, they're looking at that. Looking, hey, oh, ten years from now. I, I plan to be fluent in Chinese. Well, I say, well, why not you be fluent right now? You know, what, you, you know 300 words, 500 words, get fluent in those, you know? And the, the great thing is that as you practice your proficiency and build your fluency in those, you absolutely will start acquiring new words along the way. It's unavoidable. All right, so let's look at the reverse. Like if you're not doing it that way, what might you be doing that doesn't work well? And one of the first things that um, people all often do is they're like, oh, I want to learn Chinese, so 
I'm going to download this flashcard app. I'm going to download a, a word list, probably HSK, and then I'm just going to memorize all these words. And even though I think they know deep down that memorizing a word list does not equal becoming proficient in a language, they just kind of see it as a convenient proxy for progress in the language. And yeah, it is progress, but it's just one part of the progress, and they kind of neglect everything else. So that's one thing that um, I see people doing a lot. And yeah, you need to learn vocabulary, but you need to do other stuff as well. And then moving on to like kind of the next step in that failure to get an overall fluency going is um, if you build vocabulary, you work on grammar, and then you work on reading, but then you only work on reading. And what happens is you become kind of dependent on being able to read at your own pace and, you know, really carefully identify each character and then identify the word. And that's good. You need to do that. But then when people are talking really quickly and, you know, you have to speak, that practice that you did doesn't equate to being able to spit out, you know, fluent answers or even to comprehend their questions. You know, I think a lot of these things, it has to go back with what we are comfortable with, right? And when we're talking about, like, learning new elements of the language or building proficiency, typically it's going to involve you stepping outside of your comfort zone. And that's a hard thing to do. I mean, it's not easy to just say, hey, I'm going to go talk to somebody in Chinese when I'm not confident in my level of Chinese. Or, you know, I'm reading and I'm doing flashcards because I can do that by myself. I don't have to let anyone know. I don't have to be embarrassed by, you know, trying to struggle with a character in front of somebody else or use the wrong tone. I mean, this this is it's really common. And, and anyone here listening, I, you can relate to that. You know what it's like. We know what it's like, John. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, so it's it's hard. It's hard to, to do this because sometimes we do our own little study program that fits to our own comfort level. And in the reality is that to sometimes break, break through these plateaus, we have to step outside of our comfort zone and we have to try doing things that we haven't been doing. Yeah, and there's this one, um, I don't know who said it, but there's this famous sentence about uh, learning to draw. And it's something like you have 10,000 really crappy drawings inside of you and you have to get them all out before you can finally learn to draw well. Or not even learn to draw well, start to draw well. You have to get out the 10,000 crappy drawings. Well, guess what? You have 10,000 crappy tones and other mispronounced <laughs> words, uh, you know, misunderstood simple things, and you got to get all those out. So it's not a matter of perfecting everything before you start talking. It's a matter of making the mistakes now, make many Get them out of your system so you can progress. I think for anyone listening now, it's saying if you're stuck in this plateaus, it's, it's probably looking back and really reexamining. Sometimes you have to get really honest with yourself, and it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to look in and say, oh, you know, wait, I realize I've been avoiding conversation. Or I've put off downloading WeChat so I can chat to someone online, right? Or whatever it is. It, but you're going to have to take some you know, focused steps forward into the areas, like if I'm, I'm weak on listening or weak on speaking, well, yeah, the only way you're going to get better at that is by listening or speaking. You know, th there is research that shows if you are extensively reading, you're going to improve in your listening, speaking, and writing. If you do no, you know, nothing else other than just the reading. But when you combine some of these things with your leveraging reading and combine it with the speaking and the listening stuff, you, you, you multiply, you accelerate. It's a catalyst, you know, for all of your learning. And so when we really take a holistic approach to language, learning a language, then we're going to really approach to more of those, like, ideal levels of fluency that we're talking about. You know, like, I can put myself in any type of situation and I'm feeling comfortable, you know, like, and at least have some sort of command of the language. That being said, you're always you're always going to be put in some sort of situation at some point, and you're like, I don't know what's going on. I imagine, John, do you still have those these days? Yeah, it happens. It happens. From time to, When you're with your buddies talking about nuclear physics, it's a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> My wife actually likes to talk about um, quantum physics. <laughs> oh, really? So actually getting better with the quantum physics vocabulary, but, <laughs> but maybe not the nuclear physics, yeah. Okay, well, there you go. Well, I, I, I even wonder, could I handle a nuclear physics conversation in English? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, and now how about a word from our sponsor? We're dying to know who it is this time. Well, let me tell you, John, it is Mandarin Companion. Yay. All right, today we're going to talk about our Level 2 book. Our Level 2 standard is based off of only 450 unique characters. And the story that I want to talk about is Great Expectations. Originally by Charles Dickens, this is a completely Chinese story, Chinese adaptation, Chinese characters 
uh, set in you know around around the year 2000. And I wanted to do this story. I thought it was a fantastic story. And when we got in writing it, it turned out to be... A monster. <laughs> a lot. It turned out to be so much more. They, we tried to condense it into one book, and it turned out to be a very long one book that didn't carry the weight of the story. Yeah, some plots can be kind of simplified and, and really cut down, but Dickens' plots, uh, not so easy to do that. Yeah, his, the original book is into three parts, and I think it's a total of like, I don't know, 70, 80 chapters, something like, don't quote me on that. But it's very long and a very complex story. We had to cut a lot of it, but we kept the very focal essence of that story, and I think it is a wonderful adaptation. And if you're looking for something to read that's pretty long, this is probably the longest, simplest book you can read in Chinese because it's two parts. You know what the total character count for both parts together is? I like, think it's roughly maybe 24,000 characters, 25,000. Yeah, it sounds right. My favorite is I wrote a story on our blog about one, a reader who uh, is sharing his experience of reading our books. And he said that when he got to the end of Great Expectations, uh, he, he, just, he, he just kept turning the page. He couldn't go to sleep. It was like 1 or 2 a.m., and when he finally got to the end of the book, he was just like in tears. He was just bawling. And I'm just like, oh, that's perfect. Oh, I just, you know, that was, that was rewarding. So anyway, so anyone who's ready for our level two books, 450 characters, go out there, check out Great Expectations. You can get it on Amazon in print or ebook. It's on iBooks. It's, it's, it's all out there. So uh, get it today. Now we're ready for rants and raves. John, what do you have for us today? A rant or a rave? I have a rave. I like to talk about a tool. Um, this is something that anyone can use, but it's especially useful for people in China. Because if you're in China, you may have noticed that you know Google services are, for some reason, mysteriously inaccessible. So you can't go to Google.com. You can't go to Google Translate. And um, I like Google Translate, not to translate, but to just give me pinyin. Uh, sometimes you want to generate some pinyin for a sentence or whatever. And uh, Google Translate actually does that for you. It gives you the pinyin as well as the English translation. It can also translate, not really translate, but convert simplified characters to traditional characters and vice versa. And it also provides pinyin for that too. So what some people don't know is if you go to translate.google.cn, the Chinese version of Google Translate is accessible in mainland China. Hallelujah. There you go. Google.cn, but it's translate.google.cn. So you might be using, you know, Baidu or something, um, but you can actually use Google if you want to. Well, good. Well, thanks for that, John. I have a rave, too. Hey, this is such a positive podcast today. I have another rave. So my rave is about a website, and it's called ChineseForums.com. So it's Chinese-Forums.com. Now, this is a great resource for anyone who's learning Chinese. This forum is broken down into different topics. It's pretty. It's really active. So there's a, a main thread for resources for studying Chinese, speaking and listening skills, reading and writing skills, grammar, sentence structure patterns, vocabulary idioms, blah blah blah. And there's even there's even a topic for tattoos, names, and quick translations. So uh, in this great, it's a very active community. There's all sorts of people getting involved in there. There is a lot of good information, and there's some people in there who are very regular posters who know a lot of stuff. So, I mean, if you have, like, a, an issue or you have some questions or something about Chinese or about this or that, it's a great forum to get involved with. There's even a forum section for about studying Chinese outside of China, universities in China, things like that. So if you're interested in you know going abroad, you want to find out about a certain school or a program – this is a great forum to get involved with. It's just filled with a lot of information. Yeah, and actually the, uh, the developer behind Pleco, the dictionary that we all love, he is active on this uh, website. Mike Love. Yes. And uh, Roddy Flagg, the founder of Chinese Forums, I know him. He's a great guy. I haven't seen him in quite a while. Hey, yeah. Roddy, if you're I, listening. Hey, Roddy, we should get him on this podcast. He's, he, he's great, and he's, he's Scottish too, so he has a great accent, yeah. as you can imagine. I like that. And one other shout-out to... Um, a guy that I've known for a while, he's very active on Chinese forums, Imran. Um, I don't know his real name. But real? I know. I, I, that's, his, that's his username, right? I guess. It is. I, I mean, I, that's, <laughs> that's how I know him, Imran. Anyway, he's a really, really intelligent guy. He always has lots of great uh, information to share, and you'll probably see him posting in almost any of those uh, forums. Pretty much. He's like you know number one poster, I think, in the forum. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not super active on there. I'm a little busy, but every time I go, I think, oh, man, I need to check this site out more often. It's so good. I, there's a wealth of topics in there. So I, you can just go read through and just 
You can pick up anything, man. So what is the URL again? Chinese forums dash. It... No. No, I'm sorry. It's... That's what you need to point out. I know. Chinese-forums.com. One more time. That's Chinese-forums.com. Thank you, Jared. Act now while supplies last. My name is Elise Ribbons, born in Detroit, raised in North Carolina. Elise and I met a number of years ago in Shanghai when she was working on a social entrepreneurship startup. Sandy blonde hair and green eyes, she looks like she was made for the silver screen. So how long is a long time to have lived in China? A Beijinger by choice for about 15, 16 years, Sinophile at heart, and recent recovering Sinophile as I've moved back to America. From being a radio host to performing in Peking Opera to a starring role in Chinese cinema, Elise's list of accomplishments goes on and on. Let's listen to Elise tell us in her own words how her whole love affair with China began. Stay with us. Hmm. Well, it started by accident. Um, it started with a bowl of instant noodles, as China stories often do. Um, but I was <laughs> studying uh, Arabic in college. I wanted to be Secretary of State someday. So I thought studying Arabic would be great because, you know, U.S. Arab relations are still so fraught. They certainly were in the 90s. I was studying Arabic. I wanted to go to Egypt to study abroad. But then because no one else had signed up for the program, it was just me. And they thought it'd be too dangerous to send some chick by herself. Just one person in the study abroad program or one person in the Arabic program? Oh, study abroad. The Arabic studies program at UNC is, is great. You know, Sahara Mer, the teacher I had was, she's like really well known in her field. Yes, yeah, so I was studying Arabic, but the study abroad program to Egypt got canceled last minute. And so, you know, I wasn't registered for any courses for the next semester. I you know, my housing had been given away. I didn't have any idea what I was going to do. So um, I was sitting in the lounge in my dorm, eating my instant noodles <laughs> um, and crying. And a friend of mine who um, he had studied in China before, McKay Barrow, he saw me and talked to me about it and told me that maybe I could consider going to China with him because he was going on this new project, this this brand new program that UNC was starting. It was called Beijing Street Life. So we were working with this amazing anthropological studies, like medical anthropology professor, Dr. Judith Farquhar, and uh, a couple of grad students and the whole semester, you know, studying in Beijing. I thought like I was totally unqualified, but he did point out that I was eating my instant noodles with chopsticks. So at least I wouldn't starve to death. <laughs> um, and fortunately, this was like before the big China studies rage happened and there weren't enough applicants. So I got the last spot. W what year was this? 2000, the Lantern Festival of 2001 ah. in January. We arrive in Beijing. I have a suitcase full of peanut butter and jelly because... I abhorred American style Chinese food and my mother thought I might starve to death. <laughs> um, little did any of us know how amazing real Chinese food is. And, you know, I quickly became a total Chinese food snob. But yeah, that sort of started it all. And just such a great group of students and the professors we worked with. You know, we had Chinese classes in the morning um, through the CET program. And then in the afternoon, we were doing anthropological field work, you know, going all over to these different places in Beijing and interviewing people and observing culture. And it was just so much fun. You know, I, I did a program a second time in 2002 um, to do it again. And I changed my major to Chinese. Yeah, to, to Asian studies with a focus on Chinese. And then I moved to China um, during SARS in 2003 because lots of job openings. So what was it about this trip, or I guess the first trip or the second trip, that really, I guess, hooked you on China? You know, when I get interviewed about this in Chinese media, I always just say it's the term yuanfen, which is often translated as serendipity. But I think of it more like you're walking a physical path. And when you're going on the right path, it's a clear path and it's very easy. And sometimes you wander off that path and you're in the brush and it's really hard to get through. And even though you're struggling, you're really trying to walk that way, it's not fun and it's not what you're supposed to be doing. And when you make it back to the path that you're supposed to be on, it's just easy. And that's what China was. It just, it was like, this makes sense. You know, I, I 
the people connected with me. I was fortunate enough to make friends because we had Chinese roommates, which, you know, many of whom I've stayed friends with, you know, like what, oh my God, 16, 17 years later, you know, and such amazing professors. The second time I went, we had Professor Yue Gong, who's just awesome. I guess it's a very formative age. Maybe I would have gone somewhere else and also fallen in love with the people in the culture, but China was my Yuan Fen. And so I was there and I just couldn't look back. Now, when did you decide to start learning Chinese? When I got into the program to study abroad there the first time. <laughs> so, so you started studying Chinese before you went on the study abroad? Yeah, um, I learned uh, a semester's worth, I think, uh, you know, so I have some pinyin and I learned how to say, <laughs> which, of course, I never heard anyone in China <laughs> ever actually say. You know, I, I go thinking I can speak Chinese and, of course, discover I cannot communicate at all. But um, the benefit of having a Chinese roommate, especially because mine didn't speak English very well, is that, you know, in order to communicate anything, you just have to find a way. And so, you know, like when I wanted to ask her if she wanted to go downstairs to eat, um, I didn't know how to ask, like, ni chilama, but I would say, like, chi Than, you know, and just point to my mouth and my stomach, right? Or just <laughs> chur, and she would get it. And so slowly, you know, she would repeat back at me what I'm supposed to say, you know, and we would we would muddle through it together through survival mechanisms. Uh, I learned Chinese in a semi haphazard way. You know, you it'd be fits and starts. You'd feel like, oh, I'm learning so much. I'm communicating so much more, and then you'd hit this wall, and you felt like I'm not learning anything. And even now, I still feel that way. You know, every time I start to think, oh, my Chinese is awesome. I totally rock at this language. I'm good to go. Then something else happens and I'm like, oh, my Chinese is crap. I need to learn so much more. <laughs> so it's like if you're a nerd who loves never ending puzzles, learning Chinese is for you. So you first had some classroom instruction. Then you went to China for the study abroad. And how long were you there in China for the study abroad? Just half a year. I think five months. Okay, so six months, five five months. Where do you think that your learnings really took off or they really started in earnest? And I mean, how did you, what was your progression? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, after my first semester studying abroad, I changed my whole major. You know, I, I went from being um, international politics to Asian studies. I proceeded to just nerd out on every Chinese language course that they offered at UNC at the time. I literally took, I think, every single one of them. And I even had a couple of independent studies um, because this was when Chinese studies was, you know, sort of still coming about, certainly here at UNC, but in most universities in America, with the exception of like Middlebury and a couple of other programs. And so I just loved it. I want to hear a little bit about what were their classes like? What was the textbooks or, or whatever? Like, what did you guys use to learn the language? Obviously, we had textbooks and the TAs, but I, I have some semi-alternative philosophies regarding language study. No, share those with us. Well, you know, I think um, immersing yourself in TV is really useful. I used to think it was film, um, but film is too short. You can't really get a grasp of like a character's language usage in the span of those two hours. So I actually had a work study job at the audiovisual library at UNC. And so I would be working at the counter or converting video footage and uh, at the same time watching a old school Chinese TV series where I understood almost nothing because, you know, I couldn't read that much Chinese. I couldn't understand that much. But, you know, through context and experience, you begin to learn a lot more in the same way that a, a child learns a language. You know, a child doesn't sit there with a textbook learning how to speak their native tongue. They just sort of experientially observe. So I did a lot of that. Fortunately, I got paid to do I mean, not to do it, but you know, I got paid to, to do that time. So <laughs> I was very fortunate. The other thing I did was uh, one of my dearest friends, Laura Barton, she and I would do Chinese corner together, just the two of us, um, where we would read like a Chinese short story and talk about it with each other in our very bad Chinese. And I'm sure the whole time we were speaking incorrectly and doing it uh, just in an embarrassingly bad way. But because we were using it to communicate, it became our language. And so, you know, when I have Chinese friends who are desperately trying to learn English, they've been studying it for 20 years, they still can't communicate. I'm always like, just talk to someone. And they're like, but there's no foreigners near me. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Just talk to anyone, talk to your cat, talk to the, the picture on the wall. It doesn't matter because it's about you practicing and getting used to it. 
So it sounds like you had a language partner and, and that's something that helped you yeah, out. Yeah, but she wasn't a native speaker. So we were both, you know, it's like letting go of that desire to be perfect was really important, which is also why I say, you know, drinking alcohol helps with language acquisition because you can relax and not <laughs> worry about, you know, if you're using the right words or the right verbs or whatever, you can just communicate and the other person will muddle through and help you figure out what it is you're trying to communicate and friendships happen and the language just naturally evolves for you. But obviously, you know, like I, I often do like speaking gigs at the universities here in North Carolina, talking about learning Chinese and the experience working there. And I've been reprimanded a few times for recommending alcohol consumption, but it really does help. <laughs> So I guess if you need to lower your inhibitions, right? Yeah, it's, it's letting go of the desire to be perfect. Very few native Chinese speakers actually speak Chinese well. Um, they might speak their dialect well, but they probably don't speak Mandarin perfectly. More so, they probably don't have a very elevated level of Mandarin. There's, there's always more to learn. And I had a, a professor at Beida tell me once that even he, and he was in his 60s, was still working on his Mandarin. You know, and he's a Beijing born Chinese professor who was in the Chinese studies department, right? Wow. Not to like, you know, make people feel like, oh, you'll never learn it. It's just there's always the new joys of learning more about it, I guess. Well, at what point do you feel like your Chinese really started to take off or you feel like you started to really gain a, a good grasp of the language? The first time I really felt like I could communicate in Chinese was when we did a, uh, it was during the study abroad, the first study abroad program. We had a weekend away in Qingdao where we had an immersion weekend. We weren't allowed to say anything in English ever. And um, because we've already, we'd already had like a month or two of the intense Chinese courses, we had enough Chinese to sort of basically communicate like you know if you say you're thirsty and you want some water you know, where is the bathroom all of those basic things well because we all of a sudden had to use it exclusively it was like this big hurdle I got over like all of a sudden oh I can use Chinese anytime I want and it was that was probably the biggest leap for me but then later on every time like literally every time I watch a Chinese tv series no matter how crappy the acting or lame the storyline it improves my language skills so much because unlike um, American TV series, uh, Chinese TV series are usually written by one person. So it is one language style, one conversational mm. style, even though the actors will add their own flair and the director might change some things, the language like in the vocabulary used is really uh, finite. You know, it's one person's contribution. And so by watching a 20 part or 40 part series from, point A to point Z, you get a lot of the same stuff over and over again. And so it really sinks in what stuff means. Well, something also I'd like to hear a little bit about is uh, about like learning characters. I mean, what part did characters play in you learning Chinese and when did you start learning them and how did that all work out for you? Yeah. So I was learning characters the whole time. Um, and I cannot emphasize enough how important that is. Um, you can be illiterate and speak English fairly well. And just by talking to people or listening to things, watching the news or whatever, you can be fairly erudite and, and, and knowledgeable about things and be aware of history and culture. But in Chinese, because there's so many references in every statement, not just with cheng yus or xie you or anything, but with just basic references that anyone says. You know, I had a professor, um, Dr. Henry, at UNC who told us that anytime a Chinese person says anything, there's at least three historical references in that statement. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously it's a little, that's a little, little uh, extreme, but it's often really true. And even if people don't know they're doing it, there's constant references. The language is very layered. And so if you don't know the characters, you can't ever get those layers. And you know, I have some uh, some friends who've been in China for a long time, as well as some actor friends who they speak Chinese so well, they sound so good. And yet, because they're illiterate, they have this this stunted conversation. They can't go beyond a certain point because they, they just there's no capability to understand because, the you know, something sounds the same or something is a pun and everything, you know, can be more than what it is. Hence the reason I think learning Chinese is a never-ending treasure. 
you know, I always feel that characters are kind of the key to the language. Exactly. They can really unlock the meaning of it. And there's so much joy to it once you've learned the characters. And I, I really think that, especially when you're learning a language as different as Chinese is from English, it opens up a different part of your brain. And you can just think about things differently. You know, I've, I was not a good memorizer before I studied Chinese. And then it helped me to develop that skill to the extent now where, you know, I can memorize like the best of them. Hmm. It's, it's really because of the way the language flows. Like if you tell me a phone number, an 11 digit phone number in English, I will not remember it. If you tell me it in Chinese, I will remember. Oh yeah. Numbers are easier to retain in your memory in Chinese for sure. But also, you know, phrases, poems, there's a certain musicality to the language that is, yeah. But sorry, I could wax poetic all day about it. I've got to say my number one benefit from studying abroad in China is, you know, as an American, I had never had a ton of discipline in my studies before, <laughs> you know, like, you know, be your best self or whatever, but your passion was what you're supposed to follow. But, you know, if you don't have discipline, you don't really make the extra effort. You know, some students are really good at that. I was not. Um, but because I had to have so much discipline in order to learn the characters, you know, we had a, a 50 character quiz every, every Friday and we had a koyu kashi every Friday. Like you just, you know, it was like a factor you had to learn. And so all of a sudden I had to memorize, I had to study and it instilled this academic discipline in me to the extent where before I went to China, my grades were okay, but they weren't amazing. But after I came back, I took double the course load and got all A's like the rest of the, the time. Wow. Not all A's in every single class. I don't want anyone to fact check me. I think I got a, like a couple of these. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it was it, my counselor was like, you're taking 24 hours. That's the the highest limit. And we, you know, and a lot of them, these are complex classes. And I was like, yeah, but I studied Chinese. I'm good now because <laughs> <laughs> it just it, it develops this ability to and it, it might be linguistic it might be in the brain like you know i do know there was a study done i believe it was in the uk when british su students solved a math problem they used this particular portion of the brain but when chinese students solved a math problem they were using a totally different portion of the brain oh that's interesting you know on that there's a, a study done by was, i think it was in the book freakonomics mm -hmm. of stephen dubner and stephen levitt mm -hmm. because uh, the actual Numbers in Chinese, they're shorter in length. So, you know, like qi versus seven, mm -hmm. you know, seven, it's two syllables versus one syllable. And it's it actually takes up less memory in your brain to process. So you're able to process it much quicker versus like French, where you get into like 80, it's uh, oh, quatre vingt, you know, yeah, no, just to say yeah. 80 and then quatre vingt, whatever. And it looked like, um, you know, in, in, in general that like Chinese people do better at math. And that's one of the reasons why. All right. So Elise, that's pretty cool. So you've really developed a lot of your Chinese skills. Now, what kind of opportunities have that brought for you? In China, your ability to speak Chinese as well as understand the culture is like a golden key. While there's plenty of Chinese people who can speak and understand English and, and, and American or British culture very well, there's very few um, non-native Chinese speakers who can communicate well in Chinese and Mandarin. And so there's just a ton of opportunity in every field. Obviously, there were plenty of negative situations where, you know, my Chinese was too good. So I was asked to speak more poorly. And then obviously when acting or doing TV shows, I've often been asked to make my Chinese worse. Well, no, wait a second here. Tell us a little bit about how did you even get into doing acting in China? And and some of this acting, it's, it's in Chinese? Or are, you, are you playing like the uh, dumb foreigner on the film or show? Or Tell us just about yeah. how that worked out and what kind of roles you played. So I, I don't take those kind of roles anymore. I, um, I started acting because I had done acting, um, you know, since I was a kid. I'd always loved theater. I'd done some drama coursework at UNC. And so the first play I got into is called Kites of New York. It was a story about a, um, you know, a Beijinger who had moved to New York and I was to play his girlfriend. And that was actually a really good role, if not super huge, but it was at the People's Arts Theater in Beijing. And being on stage again was like, oh, you know, because I had my day job at the U.S. Embassy, which was a great job and a great opportunity um, you know, doing cultural affairs. I was a virtual outreach officer. So, you know, kind of 
on the forefront of trying to combat the misinformation campaigns, you know. How did you get this audition even for this play? They were desperately searching for an American. There's plenty of Russians who can speak Mandarin well enough. But to, to perform in a play, you've really got to be able to enunciate in Mandarin and project. Yeah, it was through a friend of a friend. And so I, you know, went and met with them. And, <laughs> and they said, you'll you know, do. <laughs> um, and I can act on stage. So they're like, okay, great. And just being on stage again was so intoxicating that, you know, I decided to to try to explore it some more. I just sort of, I, because I, I, I became friends with the producers and the director, I got to see how one does a play in Beijing from start to finish. I'm not talking about writing it or directing it. I mean, really like, you know, connecting with the theater and going through the censorship process and all of that. So I decided that I would try my hand at it as well. I had written some scripts before, so I wrote my first play, I Heart Beijing, oh. um, in 2006. What was your play about? It was sort of a sitcom story. It was about an American girl and a, a Chinese girl who were roommates and best friends and sort of the antics that ensued their group of friends. The Chinese girl's older brother hated the American girl because he thought the American girl was leading his younger sister astray because his younger sister was smoking and like dating all these boys, but really the American girl was the conservative one and just lots of fun sort of cultural misunderstandings that led to a delightful, happy ending, of course. Was this play in Chinese or English? No, this play was in English and we had sold out shows both runs. I was very honored and thrilled that the, you know, the community in Beijing was so supportive. Um, and I had great actors that were working with me. Well, how did that lead into you performing in different, I know you've been on some TV shows in China. You've been in some movies. Talk a little bit about that. I guess the easy, I mean, it's like, it was a complicated road. I wrote another play about my experience for learning Chinese called Green Eyes on Chinese. And this play was written in Chinese called Lü Yanjing Shi Hei Han Zi. And it was about the process that you kind of go through in order to learn a foreign language. And so it starts, you know, like the night before a major exam. I'm in my dorm. I'm trying to go over all of these vocab lists. There's the insane vocab list regarding flowers. You know, there's these characters with the tzal to toe, you know, the, the grass radical on the top. And just random characters you don't ever use in any other circumstance. And they describe a flower that you've never seen and have no idea what it is, but you have to remember <laughs> it. And, and then I went through the ridiculous xie hou yu and um, the naughty puns in Chinese history and just had a real delightful time. But as it gets further on in the evening, um, there's this character who's played by this gorgeous dancer, Xiao Hua, and um, she kind of starts to peek out and starts to join in more. And at first, she's just sort of a passive dancer in the background, but she gets more and more life. Um, and she's kind of like my Chinese id, you know, the inner version of me that's actually a Chinese woman, you know, because when you learn a language like that, you kind of develop this other personality. And so through the evening, she gains more and more strength until finally we have this like fight scene where she turns into a tiger mother and starts yelling at me when I try to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, then the next morning I wake up and run off to take the exam. It, it wasn't a terribly deep play. It was a linguistic farcical joy, but, um, I got a lot of good, uh, reviews because Chinese people who'd studied English had actually gone through the same sort of phenomenon where they had developed this, you know, English version of themselves. And that English ego would often fight with the Chinese ego. You know, and which one are you? You kind of develop more as you learn more languages. I was then interviewed by a journalist with CRI for their um, global news division. CRI is? China Radio International but it was for the um, domestic news, not the English language one. Okay. And so then someone else at the station heard me. They heard I could communicate intelligently in Mandarin. And so they invited me as a guest host at first for this program called La Wai Kan Dian, which is, I guess, international perspectives. And I really enjoyed doing the show. And so I became the main foreign host. It was me, a Russian guy and a Chinese guy discussing news and events. And it was just so much fun, such a delight, because we'd often start that conversation from very different places, very different perspectives and assumptions. But by the end of the conversation, we would have talked ourselves into the center. 
So what was it like mm-hmm. being on that radio show? Yeah, and it was one of the best things in my life. I'm, it's honestly one of the things I miss the most other than amazing Chinese food because, you know, my other co-hosts were fantastic. Peter, the, the Beijing co-host, often got flack because everyone always thought that I was an ABC and that he was not a native Chinese speaker. <laughs> and so it was very, very funny. But he's amazing. And it was always a bit of a an interesting struggle because I refuse to lie about anything or paint anything for a propagandic way. So there were some conversations that we just couldn't have an honest discussion about. And so we'd have to then change subjects, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was really good about respecting me, but also very helpful with, you know, sometimes there are certain conversations that are very sensitive in China, the word mingan is used a lot by people who work in media because, you know, you have to self-censor, you have to worry about what topics are kosher to discuss at any given time. For our listeners, give us the definition of mingan. Oh, mingan literally just means sensitive. In Chinese, when you're saying a sensitive topic, that could be like Tibetan freedom, right? That's obviously a sensitive topic, but it could also be something like Jiang Qing, Mao Zedong's wife. She is a very mingan Mm. um, topic. Or it could be like the housing bubble or, you know, anything that is considered a a social hot button issue is not usually something that you want to be discussing because it's just it can lead to dangerous territory. What was your favorite role that you played in any program or show? Oh, um, hands down, playing Helen Snow was my favorite. It was such a great honor. Now tell us, who is Helen Snow? And what was the show? Oh, my God. Helen Snow is amazing. She is this American author who in 1932 moved to Shanghai on her own, like getting us, she had a string position with like the silver exchange to write some articles, got herself a job at the U S consulate. She became the like social queen bee of Shanghai. She just sort of went after her dreams and got them. And it was just very, she's very impressive. And even though she wasn't as linguistically talented as some other China hands, she really made an effort to connect with people. You know, she didn't just make friends with people and um, connect on that level. She was an active participant in helping students during the revolution. You know, in Beijing, she and her husband, Edgar Snow, fundamental to the December, I want to say December 9th or December 12th movement, where the students protested in the streets against uh, Song Zhiyuan. He was the, the KMT leader for the North because the students protested at that time and Edgar and Helen got international media to write about it. So, you know, then there was pressure on the KMT to not give over Huawei to, to the Japanese. And so I have argued um, successfully, I mean, getting Chinese people to agree with me that if it weren't for her, the war could have gone very differently because Huawei would have belonged to the Japanese. It would have been a very difficult fight back at that point. What was the name of the show? A red Star Over China, which actually leads to the thing that most people are familiar with, which is the book that she and her husband wrote called Red Star Over China. And she had this fantastic adventure of once she had gotten um, back to Xi'an from Yan'an, she had all these photos, which were obviously contraband and could have, if she'd been discovered, you know, would, would have gotten her thrown in jail. And um, there were suspicions. And so she was put under you know, house arrest at the hotel, but she managed to escape and sneak out. And, you know, the train she was on was bombed. And fortunately she got off and it was just lots of amazing, crazy adventures that you just can't, you can't imagine are real, you know? So it sounds like this, um, this role was more than just a normal role for you. This took on a, you know, much more meaning to you. Yeah. I kind of took an unhealthy relationship to it. Well, that's that's really interesting, all that historical perspective. There's a lot of things in there I I had no idea about. Well, Elise, tell me a little bit. uh, If you could go back, if you could go back in time and uh, give yourself some advice when you had started your whole China adventure, whether it was learning Chinese or coming to China, what would you tell yourself? Keep a diary. (laughs) I mean... Later on, when digital photos became a thing because of, you know, phones, um, that helped a lot. But I often forget about all of the amazing things that I've had the the chance to do and see and participate in because 
there's just so much crazy stuff going on every day in China that it starts to kind of all combine with each other. And so I kind of wish that I'd kept a better diary at the beginning, um, especially because, you know, I often won't remember a story until I'm like scrolling through my, my phone or on my computer. And there's like that photo from that event. You're like, oh my God, I did that, didn't I? Whoa. The observations you have when you first come to China, when you don't have the assumptions, I think are very important. Even if you feel like they're dumb or silly or you're like, I'm going to burn this later. You know, I think having that recorded, having your thoughts fresh is, you know, it helps you to treasure it later. Oh, I'm really missing China right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've you spent over 15 years in China. Mm-hmm. You know, you've, you've moved back to the States. Mm-hmm. Um, what part is China? What part do you, going forward in your life, how do you see, still see yourself involved with China? And how is Chinese still a part of your life today? I moved back to America to sort of take some time to reacquaint myself with myself and to, you know, get my health back in order to start a family. I, I participate a lot in the Chinese community here in North Carolina. We actually have a huge percentage of Chapel Hill's um, population is Chinese, like recent emigres. So, you know, there's a North Carolina Picking Opera Society where um, I host, I co-host the events um, and I get to see some amazing picking up for performances, which is a delight and weird and wonderful. And there's, you know, so many academics here from the Chinese diaspora that there's a lot of culture that you can connect with. Well, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's learning Chinese right now? Finding a hobby that you enjoy that isn't necessarily language-based, like music or sport of some sort, um, but definitely immerse yourself, find a way to make friends with Chinese people who aren't just trying to learn English. Because, you know, if you spend time with people who all the time are wanting to work on their English, you'll never work on your Chinese. And just, you know, find your joy, find the fun that you really like. Chinese is such a a big thing to study. You know, maybe what you're really interested in is ancient Chinese, or maybe what you're really interested in is Kung Fu novels, or or maybe what you're really interested in is food. Just find the thing that you love and really go with it because the language is surprisingly easy. It's the vocabulary that can be hard. And obviously, watch Chinese TV shows. Don't watch Red Star Over China. It's propaganda, but you know, other Chinese <laughs> TV shows. You just got to start from episode one. So I always recommend to people, find a TV series with an actor that you think is hot or actress, obviously, you know. Find someone that you think is hot because that will help you suffer through the rest of it. <laughs> well, Elise, would you rather fight 100 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? Mm, one horse-sized duck for sure. Why is that? Because first of all, I would make friends with it. And then once it's tamed, I can ride around on a giant duck. And that sounds pretty freaking awesome. <laughs> Second of all, 100, they're just going to overpower you eventually. You know, there's only so much you can do. Have you seen Game of Thrones, right? Like, I'm now envisioning what kind of saddle I could put on my deck. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sure you can get one made in China. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, painter, baker, scientist, dog walker, gamer, programmer, astronomer, and that one guy named Derek. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mandarincompanion.com. Apologies to Mark Zuckerberg. We just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself. Yep, just me, Jared Turner. I'd like to thank Elise Ribbons and my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Pasden. See you next time. (laughs) 